Hey guys, some users reported not being able to see their messages. Oh, boss, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're running out of RAM on our MongoDB instance. Can we fix this? Mother Okay, so that's not exactly what happened at Discord back in 2015, but before Discord managed to store billions or trillions of messages, they did have some hiccups when they started to surpass the 100 plus million store messages. At the time, they were using MongoDB, one of the best databases for iterating quickly. MongoDB is a NoSQL, document-oriented database that provides flexible data model, making it easy to develop and ship a feature quickly. Discord's messages were stored in a single MongoDB collection with a single compound index of channel ID and created at. Indexes are a special data structure that is stored in RAM to improve the speed of data retrieval. As you can imagine, as more messages are being added on a daily basis, more memory is required to store the actual records as well as the new data in the index. Since everything is stored in a single collection with no partition, both the data and the index were no longer able to fit in RAM. Why don't we do some calculations? So for the data size, assuming on average, each message is about 50 characters in length, that would be 50 bytes. And let's say that for the channel ID and message ID, it's about eight bytes each, so that's 16 bytes. And for the created ad, we'll allocate eight bytes for that as well. So combined together, we have 74 bytes, times that by 100 million records, we're looking at 6.88 gigabyte. And for the index size, for the channel ID and message ID, both combined, 16 bytes. And let's say another eight bytes for the actual reference to the actual document, we're looking at 24 bytes per document, 24 bytes times 100 million is around 2.4 gigabyte. If this were to store both the data and the index in RAM, we're talking about 9.28 gigabyte worth of memory. Not as much as my waifu folder, but that's still a lot of data. Now imagine if we're talking about 1 billion or 1 trillion worth of records. This is an issue because if some records were not able to fit on RAM, MongoDB would essentially have to perform this I.O. operation in order to retrieve the data. Now, reading from this is significantly slower than reading from RAM and can lead to latency issues and other unpredictable behavior. Luckily, Discord knew that this would happen eventually, so they started to look into different databases as they did not want to deal with MongoDB sharding. Before choosing a new database, there were a few considerations to be had, but the main points were a database that is good at handling read and write ratio of 50-50 and something that scales really well with high availability. Cassandra is an open source distributed NoSQL database designed to handle a large amount of data across multiple servers while providing high availability and scalability. It uses a wide column store data model and store data in tables with rows and columns. Each row can have different numbers of columns, and you can add or remove columns without affecting existing data. This flexible and schemaless approach allows Discord to stay nimble and iterate quickly. Cassandra is distributed by nature. That means that data doesn't live in just one place. Data is distributed between some number of nodes. This is called partitioning. To identify which nodes contain the data you're looking for, the partition key goes through a hashing algorithm that tells you which node it is. All data for a single partition always lives on the same node, so that you don't have to query from multiple different nodes. The clustering key is used to sort data within a partition. The partition key plus the clustering key combined are used as a primary key for data lookup. So how are data migrated from MongoDB to Cassandra? Recall that the original MongoDB compound index was comprised of channel ID and created ad. When Discord migrated to Cassandra, channel ID was used as the partition key. However, they decided to not use the created ad as the clustering key but to use a message ID which is a snowflake ID that is already chronologically sorted. A snowflake ID is a unique identifier used in distributed system, often structured with a timestamp machine information, and a sequence number to ensure global uniqueness and sortable order of data records. When the time came to migrate existing data to Cassandra, they started to see a warning message saying that partition size were going over 100 megabytes in size. Having large partitions is not good because it puts a lot of GC pressure on Cassandra during compaction, cluster expansion, and more. Large partitions mean that data cannot be distributed around the cluster evenly. Some nodes will contain more data than others. Remember how Discord was using channel ID as a partition key? Now imagine if a really popular channel lives on node 1, and it contains millions and millions of messages, and this angular channel has 10 messages that live on node 2. This will cause an uneven workload between node 1 and node 2. 
So Discord decided to create subpartition by bucketing their messages by 10 days intervals. They decided that if they store about 10 days worth of messages within a single bucket, then they can easily stay under the 100 megabyte in partition size. The final partition keys can be compounded to channel ID and the bucket. With this, their new primary key became channel ID, bucket, and message ID. To query for messages, you generate the bucket range from the current time to when the channel was created, and then you query each bucket until enough messages are collected. For popular channels, these messages will most likely contain in a single bucket, but for quiet channel, then you may have to query multiple buckets. After the switch, Cassandra provided amazing performance. Nearly sub millisecond for write, and under 5 millisecond for read, regardless of what data was being accessed. Everything is all Gucci, right, after the migration? Not exactly. Cassandra trades strong consistency for availability. Therefore, everything is an upsert. In an upsert operation, you attempt to add a new record if the record does not exist. And if the record exists with the same primary key, then the operation will update that existing record with the new data. So what happened when Cassandra was used in production? They discovered this interesting bug. When one user attempted to delete a message while another was editing it at the same time, it would end up with a row that was missing all data except the primary key and text. So if the records were deleted and you try to re-edit the same message by just passing in the primary key and the text to be edited, it would just simply create a new record with just the primary key and the text. Discord came up with two potential solutions to address this. One, write the whole message back when you're editing. Two, figure out which messages are corrupted and delete it from the database. They decided to go with option number two and delete the record that had author ID as null since it was a required field. Which makes sense since you don't want a deleted message to resurface. While solving this problem, they noticed some inefficiencies with their writes. When you delete something in Cassandra, it won't delete the record immediately. It needs time to replicate the delete to other nodes. So instead, it marks the delete with a tombstone, which is simply a marker that says, hey, don't bother with this guy, we're deleting it. These tombstones were configured to live up to 10 days before the records were permanently deleted. Discord's message schema contains 16 columns, four of which are usually set with a value while the rest are set to null. Marking a column as null is the same as deleting it in Cassandra. Due to this, Cassandra would generate 12 tombstones for each record most of the time for no reason. Luckily, this is an easy issue to fix since all you have to do is only write non-null values to Cassandra. Okay, so this next issue is kind of a funny one. One day people at Puzzle and Dragons were like, Hey, wouldn't it be funny if we mess with Discord and just delete millions of our messages and let's just leave one? Yeah, let's do it. Remember when you delete something in Cassandra, a tombstone is created to mark that data is no longer valid? However, during a scan query, Cassandra faces the challenge of distinguishing between a valid data and a tombstone. This results in the need to scan through millions of messages just to identify the one leftover message. As a result, memory is allocated for these tombstones, and they can generate a significant amount of temporary data. The garbage collector notices this and goes, Holy shit! Everyone stop doing what you're doing, we need to clean this shit up right now! To resolve this issue, they ended up doing the following. Reducing the lifespan of tombstones from 10 days to just 2 days. And they changed their query code to track empty buckets so that they wouldn't be scanned. After the migration, Discord went from storing millions of messages to billions. I hope you enjoyed this video on how Discord migrated from MongoDB to Cassandra. If you'd like to see me cover more of these technical blocks and details, please let me know in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching and see you in the next video.